Everybody knows a bad landlord, and hopefully you don't have any personal stories with one yourself. But today we're talking about New York's worst landlord. And I'm not kidding, they were voted that in 2018. We're going to be talking about the New York City Housing Authority and a major DOJ bus that was announced yesterday. And while we are absolutely not going to read the 476-page complaint, we're going to do a top-level summary of what each of these individuals is charged with, how they got here, why they're particularly dumb, because they were told that there was this investigation, this undercover investigation happening. We'll look at that. And though the last section of this video will dive into instances of black mold problems, sewage problems, lack of trash pickup, different inspection problems, lead paint problems, stemming from 2013 and forward despite lawsuits, petitions, you name it. What we're looking at on the screen right now is something from 2023 from Williamsburg. Clearly, the issue has not gone away. The issues have not gone away. So let's first talk about this DOJ bust. 70 current or former New York City Housing Authority employees are charged with bribery and embezzlement. The Department of Justice announced this yesterday on Tuesday, February 6th of 2024. This is one of the largest public corruption roundups in Justice Department history. And again, we're not going to look at this 470-something page complaint, but these 70 people engaged in varying alleged corruption and kickback schemes that occurred between 2013 and 2023 at New York City Housing Authority facilities. The investigation spanned over about a year, and arrests were made across six states and all five boroughs. And I really love that they included this visual in their release because it kind of tells a story. The red dots are developments where defendants allegedly accepted payments. The grayish dots are other developments. So if we look at where these red dots are mostly clustered, up here in this area, so this is the Central Park area here, this green block, this major cluster, most of this is contained within the East Harlem area of New York. If you hop on over to Queens, these dots down here are Jamaica and South Jamaica. And ultimately, the important connection to draw here is when we're talking about housing authority projects, their goal is supposed to be to help lower income neighborhoods find affordable housing, safe housing, and improve standard of living, not just for individuals and families, but also for the greater community. So there's necessarily going to be a correlation between the contracts that a housing authority gives out and lower income neighborhoods. And throughout everything else that we're going to look at, the ultimate question, maybe even the ultimate takeaway, is if we think that just because an organization exists to solve a problem, that problem is going to be solved, will we be disappointed or will it work out okay? So again, as far as this DOJ bust, it was the largest single-day bribery takedown in Justice Department history. So many workers were actually arrested that federal agents had a bus waiting to drive most of them to court, although others were led with U.S. Marshal vans. In response to all this, New York City Department of Investigation Commissioner Jocelyn Strauber called on significant reforms to the Public Housing Authority's no-bid contracting process. Among the 14 recommendations she made to improve the Housing Authority, reform the micro-purchase process, better oversight, create a centralized office to handle the work authorization, review work outside buildings and superintendents, and pre-qualified reviews of vendors. And the issue with something like a corruption and bribery and extortion scandal is that it's usually there's this two sides of the coin in operation, right? So you have the person who's taking the bribe. But the person offering the bribe probably isn't the most moral person in the bunch. So in addition to these kickbacks going to somebody for someone to win a bid, the contractors and vendors that are getting these bids through corrupt means are doing shoddy work, if any work at all. But to close out this DOJ thing, let's get a look at the who's who. Who are these faces? Who are these 70 people? In total, these 70 defendants demanded over, allegedly, $2 million in corrupt payments from contractors in exchange for awarding over $13 million worth of no-bid contracts. And although the U.S. Attorney's Office didn't single out any top suspects, the Daily News and the New York Post both did the math and looked at the names, and the New York Post specifically put together this wonderful list of how the top 10 individuals, the top 10 bribing individuals of these 70 that were indicted, pocketed about $1 million of the alleged $2 million total. So thanks to the New York Post, which is no surprise that it's the New York Post leading the charge here, we get to see the who's who. So this is Dwarka Rubnarain. He allegedly took over $80,000 in bribes. He looks like he's having a wonderful time. This is a wonderful time. And in exchange, he gave out over a half million in contracts to three different Bronx housing projects between 2007 and 2022. All right, we're going back further than 2013. Now I wonder what these housing projects, where they are and what they look like. They also note that his Facebook profile suggests a love of luxury European sports cars. He retired in 2022. He is posing in Venice in one of many vacation photos on his Facebook profile. Next, we're going to switch from flashy vacations and get to inspirational guy Rigoberto Charies. 
He worked as a superintendent and groundskeeper at six New York City housing projects. He pocketed at least $70,000 from $377,000 in contracts. And he's part of the Housing Authority's Coaching and Mentorship Leadership Academy. In his profile on the Housing Authority's website, he wrote this quote to inspire others. My message to you all is this. If you want something in life, go after it and be relentless. Don't give up and don't take no for an answer. Next is Namaya Branch, who was named as one of the Housing Authority's heroes. As part of that accolade, Administrator Eva Trimble said he cares so deeply and gives his all to his job. He took about $3,000 in bribes, so instead of any vacation pictures, we just have this. And to be fair, I am curious how, with just this amount, how he's the third one in this list when everyone else is in at least five figures so far. We'll see. Anyway, next we have Alex Tolizano. He paid off at least $41,000 for $205,000 in contracts awarded while serving as a Bronx superintendent over three years. He's a fan of good times. In 2022, he was suspended for 30 days after he was caught naked in bed with a woman during a work-related video conference call. So there's something, yeah. So that's fun. He's a fan of good times. Oh, the boss makes a dollar. I make a dime. And then let's read this line because it's more fun than that little video clip. The routine work call took a salacious turn when the face of a woman suddenly appeared on his video feed. Moments later, Tolizano revealed himself, apparently stark naked, as his coworkers cried, oh my god, and no. So, if there's one thing that the New York Post is going to do, it is going to find the details like that. For better or for worse. There's a picture of the police bus we talked about a little bit earlier. Next up is Elizabeth Tapia. Hey, girl. So, Elizabeth allegedly took $11,000 in bribes. Okay, so barely five figures for $66,000 worth of contracts. And our girl Elizabeth was working as a superintendent in Brooklyn between 2019 and 2021. So she did all that in two years. In 2022, she was suspended for 15 days after she admitted to approving the timesheets of her domestic partner who worked maintenance of properties under her supervision without authorization. Dang, so if you do something wrong with the timesheets, they get you up out of there quick. But contract money, whatever, but payroll money? That's where you went wrong, Liz. Oh, wait, this next line, to be fair. She also reassigned her partner's work to give him preferential schedules. Now, there's nothing more that your coworkers will hate. If they're robbed of the schedule they either already had or thought they were about to get because they should have been next in line for it, but it goes to somebody else for some unjust, unfair reason. This is probably how she got caught up right there. Because they caught her quick. She only She had two years of doing this and then was already caught up. And no photos of Liz living the high life with this money. Henry McFadder's next. He made at least 15000 in bribes from contracts worth 90000 You gotta up your margins there, Henry. And this is while he was serving as superintendent in two buildings across Brooklyn and Harlem. Another two-year stint. He was suspended for eight days in 2020 after he admitted to charging a subordinate $50 to review a resume while using his work computer. Damn, they really do not play. Sorry about these weird denture things. You know, I think this ad heard uh, Danny, Pam, and I talking about you know, end of life seniors aging yesterday on our live stream because now I'm getting ads like this. They heard us talking about Medicaid, which is different than Medicare, but I think that's why I'm getting this ad. Anyway, so McFadder was suspended for... So again, McFadder, they took disciplinary action against McFadder because he did something while on the company clock, while on the clock. So the lesson I'm learning so far is don't mess with timesheets and schedules. Juan Mercado's next. I think we got a picture here. He took... Oh, why didn't you start with this guy? Whoa, he's like the whole list. So 314000 in bribes from at least $1.76 million in contracts between 2014 and 2023. So he must have not been messing with the time clocks or his coworker schedules between 2014 and 2023. See, that's what I'm saying. You can't just go and mess with time. You can't do... You can't be reviewing your homeboy's resume on the company computer. You can't mess with timesheets. You can't give your boyfriend that works there or your domestic partner. You can't be giving your domestic partner favoritism on their schedule. But if all you're doing is taking like more than a quarter million in bribes, you'll be fine as long as you're not messing with those things. And I guess the longer you work there, you get a nice salary. He was almost at six figures. Yeah, this is Juan Mercado pictured here. And shout out to Target. I see the Target bag. Other notables include Nirmal Lorik, who allegedly made off with $153,000 from contracts worth about $1.33 million. $1.34 million. Jose Hernandez, who prosecutors said took $95,000 in bribes from $640,000 in contracts. 
and Veronica Holman, who allegedly took 80000 in bribes from around 400000 in contract. We should have led with some of these numbers. If you ask me, Frankie Villanueva allegedly took 50000 from 200000 in contract. Not a bad margin, buddy. He racked it up. Victor De Los Santos allegedly made 35000 from contracts, about 280000 And Patrick Butler allegedly took 39000 in bribes from about 330000 in contracts. You, Patrick, you got to step up your margins. Look at this difference here. Look what Frankie's doing. And talking about the information is all in good fun, but none of this stuff is actually fun for what it means in the real world. The good news here is that I don't think this is a situation where, hey, there's a big bust and then nothing will come of it. Previously, New York City's Department of Investigation brought charges against nine contractors. This is a press release from that back on September 20th, 2021. All nine individuals that are charged in this indictment ended up pleading guilty. And then in November 2022, Two superintendents for the Housing Authority pled guilty to federal bribery charges in a microcontract case that was brought forward by Damien Williams of the Southern District of New York. So even if it took a while for the corruption to come to light, it was actually cracked down on justice was served. Here's a look back at the nine contractors who ended up pleading guilty when they were first arrested. Now, what's interesting about this is, again, this is September 20th, 2021, and in all the press surrounding it, they flat out warned everybody else. We are going to look into the depth of this problem, this corruption, these no-bid contract purchase scandals. It was expected that more individuals would face charges. Brooklyn DA Eric Gonzalez came out and said, We believe that this corruption, unfortunately, goes beyond the nine people charged today, so we want to have this press conference to send a very clear message to anyone who would think about engaging in corruption and fraud that the Department of Investigation is watching. And they specify that it's in this small procurement contracting system. But these folks didn't listen. They were busy vacationing and hanging out on Zoom meetings while hanging out. Here was another highlight from that 2021 bus with just the nine individuals. There's a surveillance frame, the still frame, from an elevator with with the caption, Aw, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And you see hands meeting here. The contractor can be heard on tape, hesitating as prosecutors say he's handing over a cash-filled envelope to a man he believes is a city housing authority manager. He's standing in a Brooklyn public housing elevator and expresses concern over a surveillance camera in the lift he fears will capture the transaction. Not to worry, says the housing authority manager, who is actually a city department of investigation undercover agent. It's not working. The entire interaction was captured on tape. So this is the guy that was fooled and stupidly handed over the envelope. But I really love that this undercover really played the role well. As Singh handed over $600 in an envelope to the undercover agent, he asked, there's no cameras in here, right? The undercover first said no, then clarified, there is one, but it's not working. Singh goes, are you sure? And the undercover, as a great role-playing actor, goes, I'm positive. Trust me, I wouldn't have touched it if it was. That's another one that's on our list of stuff to fix. And again, another emphasis from Eric Gonzalez, Brooklyn DA. We have every reason to believe that there are other superintendents being offered bribes. We asked them to come forward, and I want to make it clear that we are watching. But bribes aren't the only issue, so let's switch away from thinking about, all right, money's being handed over in envelopes, and people are, people are going on vacations and doing whatever they're doing as the product of their corrupt behavior, of their corrupt actions. But what's happening on the other side of that? Now, for years publications, and first we're going to look at something from the city, the publication The City, they've been advocating for years and investigating this type of thing for years and warning that these types of no-bid contracts will lead to a lack of competition, which means shoddy work if no work at all. They've done a series of their own reports. They've done a, a big special report on this type of thing and asked for a lot of FOIL requests to uncover information in different records. And they put together this report on one contractor that pocketed nearly $2 million in these micro contracts including for labor investigators say was ultimately performed by housing authority employees. So they get the contract work from the housing authority. They get the contract bid, but then they don't do the labor. The labor goes back to the housing authority. And a peek into how this works is here. To tackle a mountain of repair requests, the agency lets development managers hire private contractors without seeking competitive bids, as long as the contract is below $5,000. So the city of the publication found evidence that some managers often turn to a small group of favored vendors who win these contracts again and again, defeating the purpose of competitive bidding rules that aim to ensure taxpayers get the best bang for their buck. One case in point, Matrix Construction, a firm created by a former New York City Housing Authority manager, so he knows how it goes, 
that operates out of the basement of his queen's home. So this is contractor Lewis Sykes, and it's showing that because of public records, his home was listed as his primary office. So shout out to the research there for Ben Frachtenberg. Since Matrix formed in 2015, it's been awarded 428 under 5,000 bid-free housing contracts, totaling more than $1.8 million. So, so let's pause and like really bullet point that out. Louis Sykes used to work as a manager at the New York City Housing Authority. He leaves. He's done doing that. By at least October 4th, 2019, he's running his own construction firm just out of a basement in Queens. Which it's not, doesn't mean anything if a handyman lists their own home as their own office if they're self-employed. But this looks deeper than that. This looks like somebody that goes, hey, we've got these micro contracts that I keep managing. I could just run this up. I'll, I'll create an entity, a business entity, and we'll get this going. We'll get a bunch of these bids. And then I'm just going to have labor from the, the New York City Housing Authority. We'll have all the work done by them. So I don't need to worry about the fulfillment. I'll just collect the contracts. And there's not going to be oversight of it. Because that's just how I'm observing this works while I'm here, working here. So he saw the vision, and he hopped up and formed Matrix Construction, and he executed on it. So evidence that surfaced in an internal probe by the DOI indicated that some repair work Matrix build for was done by the Housing Authority's own staff. In the spring of 2015, for instance, the Housing Authority hired Matrix to clean out 28 apartments at the Van Dyke Houses in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Over two weeks, Matrix was awarded five separate under $5,000 contracts and billed the Authority $21,000. So they're awarded less than $25,000 in contracts, but then also bill $21,000 in, in labor to the Housing Authority. The internal DOI report, which the city obtained under FOIA, reveals that probers found work orders showing repairs in all but one of the apartments were actually performed by the Housing Authority staff, but Matrix got paid for the jobs. Investigators also found there was no documentation that the New York City Housing Authority had inspected much of the work Matrix billed for. Matrix, Matrix's owner denies any wrongdoing. And while I'm not going to concede that at all, I'm not going to agree with that, I do want to wonder who was approving this work. Was it just approved as a matter of policy, like like a loophole? Or was someone else like approving this work without going like, hey, well, why aren't you doing the labor for paying you to do the work as a contractor? And then it gets worse. So for some tenants, Matrix's work left much to be desired. For instance, New York City Housing Authority awarded the company multiple no-bid contracts last May to rehab bathtubs in several apartments in the aging Morris houses in the South Bronx. Over a two-week period, Matrix got four under $5,000 contracts totaling $16,140 to install tub surrounds and grab bars in six apartments. Tenants in some of the apartments told the city that the work was either repeatedly delayed or had to be done over. One tenant, Yvette Vega, 36, lives in a one-bedroom apartment with her husband, Manuel Rivera, five-year-old twins, Kaylin and Jalen, and a 16-year-old daughter, Naya. Her bathroom had become infested with black mold, a pervasive problem in the Housing Authority's aging buildings. And because her twins have asthma, her case was particularly dangerous. So Housing Authority workers come and tear out the wall while trying to find the leak, and then afterwards the bathroom needs this new tub surround. So the city pulls contract records and finds out that on May 1st, the Housing Authority gave Matrix almost $5,000 in a no-bid contract, just $30 below the cutoff, for tub work in two Morris apartments. And her family lived in one of these apartments. Her apartment was one of them. She says the contractor came to do the work, but left without installing a handle on the shower faucet. So she had to use a wrench every time anyone wanted to use a shower or a bath. She complained to the housing authority, who ordered a new handle. They came out to do the job, but they had to come back out and do it again. I've replaced, I've replaced my valve seal by myself in my own shower. Like, it was, like, from, like, 65. It was going bad. There was a little leak. So I fixed it. Why can't this contractor that's getting paid? I wish I got I wish I got a couple grand to fix my own shower valve. And installing the handle, you have to like take off the handle and reinstall it as part of that. Like I ended up getting a new handle anyway. So really I did more work than just install a handle. Why can't these people install a shower handle for a couple thousand bucks? And at another Morris House apartment last spring, matrix workers made the mistake of screwing the metal bars into the plaster wall. Instead of metal studs behind the wall, according to sources familiar with what happened. So, okay, imagine you're in the shower and you're about to slip and fall. 
and you grab onto your grab bar to save yourself from falling. And it rips out because it's in plaster and not in a stud. Like, let me know if you have any construction knowledge whatsoever. Let me rephrase that. Let me know if you have like zero construction experience because this is who I really want to ask. You, you're not a construction worker. You're not a handyman. You can switch a light bulb maybe, but everything else is kind of like, someone else help me, please. Do you understand just common sense wise why you can't just screw something into a plaster wall and not into a stud? Especially a grab handle for a shower. Please let me know. So the grab bars were useless and had to be replaced by housing authority workers. So all this money, like they're putting out, they're giving this money to this matrix company who's familiar with how the housing authority pays out these contracts and how they can send their own labor out to do things. And he's just running the cycle of shoddy work and, oh, give me the contract. Oh, housing authority's got to go fix the work I'm either not doing or doing really poorly. Oh my gosh. And then after this very specific example where I'm rolling my eyes, I'm shaking my head at, the city draws down to their main point, right? So the authority is increasing reliance on the use of no-bid contracts, which allows building managers to hire contractors at will with little oversight, has coincided with the housing authority struggle to attack its huge backlog of repair requests. So all this money is getting paid out and no progress is being made. And how could it if every time a contract's paid out, the housing authority has to add a new work order because they didn't do the work? So by early 2013, the logjam had grown to 420,000 open repair requests. Then Mayor Michael Bloomberg ordered New York City Housing Authority to bring those numbers down. By May 2018, the Housing Authority reported the backlog had dropped to 150,000. As of August, so May to August, it had climbed back up to 312,000. Meanwhile, the amount spent on no-bid contracts took off year after year from 3.2 million from 32.2 million in 2014 to 61.1 million last year. So they're spending double the amount in housing contracts. And before you look at this graph, this bar here from 2019 is only the numbers through August. So we're missing a whole quarter of the year, four months of the year. So if you project this up, it's still going to float around here if it's going at the same pace. So all told, since January of 2014, the Housing Authority has spent more than 251 million on more than 90,000 no bid contracts. And the city wants to warn that you know, the New York City Housing Authority, because they're a landlord to more than 400,000 New Yorkers, they need to be concerned of the potential problems with these no-bid contracts and the corruption surrounding them, especially since the DOI has warned the Housing Authority three different times about the vulnerability to corruption, urging them to aggressively track how the money is being spent and whether the work is being performed. So while the city is looking at all these documents and data, they noticed a disturbing pattern In 2015, the Housing Authority awarded $54 million in no-bid contracts to to 1,512 vendors. Sounds gravy. But a third of those contracts, so $18 million worth, went to just 17 vendors of those 1,512. So so like just over 1% of the total number of vendors is getting a third of this money. And the range, cool, so we get a range here. So of those 17 vendors... They, the money they pocketed ranged between 514000 and $1.7 million. And DOI investigators pointed out that even though the Housing Authority managers say that they monitor, they carefully monitor all bids looking for suspicious activity, the DOI notes, hey, the Housing Authority couldn't provide us any examples of this happening. And instead said that these types of no-bid contracts are very rarely rejected. And these issues kept re-emerging, and the DOI kept making mention and urging the housing authority to just do better. And to tie it all up, we get one more detail here about Lewis Sykes and Matrix. So they are telling us here that his first contract, at least his first contract, was approved by a former colleague of his. And that former colleague went to go on and signed 221 no-bid contracts to Matrix worth a total of $1 million. And remember, the reason the housing authority auditors actually reported this or noticed this wasn't exactly because of the contracts themselves, but because Lewis Sykes was repeatedly using Housing Authority staff to actually perform the labor, to perform the repairs for what was the underlying work of these contracts. And so the DOI ends up finding work orders for the same job, one stating that it was a Housing Authority worker that did the job, and then another one that was actually signed by Matrix, the apartment's tenant. 
And then they'd find a copy of that work order, and that one would be, that copy would be signed by Matrix. But Matrix submitted a bill for $2,439 anyway to get paid for the work that they didn't actually do. And it kept happening. In another example, one tenant was waiting on a work order for painting to be filled. And when she was told she'd have to wait to the following year for the work to be done, she just went and painted it herself. Then Lewis Sykes filed a, a bill. He billed for it. He billed the housing authority for it, saying that he did the job personally. Oops. Sykes accepted an interview with the city and said, I haven't done anything wrong. I told them, the DOI, anything they needed to hear. I told them the truth, and I haven't had a problem since. And ultimately, the city makes a point that the issues exposed by the Matrix situation expose a number of issues that go well beyond what Sykes was doing. So isn't that crazy? And the example we looked at is just one contractor that was playing the system, had the whole scheme worked out. And the issues aren't just, oh, we don't have a handle on a shower faucet, which shouldn't be an issue. You should have a faucet on your shower. You should have a handle on your shower faucet. But beyond the corruption issues with these micro-purchase, no-bid contracts, there's a multitude of other issues. And they're so widespread and so diverse in what they are that they can't just be blamed on 70 people embezzling money and taking bribes. Lead paint has been an issue for decades, and the New York City Housing Authority has not made forward progress with it. Here's a 2017 article complaining that the Housing Authority was hiring uncertified workers for lead paint inspections and removals. The agency falsely claimed it was conducting annual inspections of 55,000 apartments for lead paint over a four-year period. That included 4,232 units housing kids younger than six who are most susceptible to eating, peeling, dangerous lead paint chips. Inspections were conducted sporadically between 2012 and early 2016 and resumed only in the subset of, four, subset of 4,232 units in the spring of 2016. So instead of this annual inspection, they're doing sporadic inspections and really just making sure they check the box of this vulnerable group. Of the problems they find, they fix the problems in just over half of these units. But for that work, not all of the employees were certified. Even after Housing Authority officials discovered in mid-2016 that they had been violating city and federal laws requiring inspections, they never informed tenants. Mayor de Blasio knew about the feelings as early as April 2016, but has suggested the city wasn't obligated to inform residents. Now, mind you, we just have, we don't have a quote here. It just says, but has suggested. So maybe take that with a grain of salt. But still, the inspections weren't being done. The work wasn't done up to speed. And it wasn't done by people that were certified in lead paint inspections and removals. And sewage is a problem, too. If you look back, you'll find no shortage of stories about sewage for the last two decades with Housing Authority-owned units in New York. This article is from 2015. And even though this is experienced by multiple tenants, Ebony Holmes gave us an inside look on what she had to go through and how the Housing Authority helped. For Ebony Homes and other tenants, her home was covered with feces, water was flying out with cigarette butts in it, and after multiple complaints, she had to go seek help from a councilman. The Housing Authority finally provided her with a temporary one-bedroom replacement in the same building, in the same complex. So her and her two kids are put up in this extra empty unit that no one's using, and there's no furniture or anything inside, so she ends up having to go stay with a friend anyway. Her furniture was ruined, clothes and equipment were ruined, and it wasn't the first time raw sewage flooded the apartment. Stuff was damaged and she had to replace it the year before. So Ebony says, I don't want it to happen a third time. This is sewer water. It has feces in it, cigarette butts, all types of stuff. Another tenant at the same building said that since he moved into the building in 2007, his sink has clogged at least six times. Each time he had to call multiple times before anyone showed up. Last time, he said it took a good month and a half to come. He said when a plumber finally showed up, he didn't even have a plunger. He asked me if I had a plunger, he said. It's ridiculous. And again, there's no shortage of these sewage videos, but... I showed this clip at the beginning. This is 2023. Worst of all, often it's flushed contents of dozens and dozens of toilets pouring into the sidewalks outside the Barinkin Plaza houses. These buildings need to be gutted out. They need to be redeveloped. I Tenant association so she can't use the sidewalk. Jennifer Lewis continues to document what? the issue in these videos taken in recent weeks, despite NYCHA's claim to us back in May that the problem is being addressed. When we first brought you the story, we saw workers fixing the piping. You still see a wet spot. She took me on another tour of the development where sidewalks are stained. And this is a good time to remember, like, sometimes if you've got something going on like this, 
Follow the local news, contact local journalists, because that the attention that things can get like that, especially locally, can kind of light the fire. In brown. And shout out to Shaniqua Lewis, because they just said here that she showed us all these different things, more than one thing. She's not just waiting for the problem to solve itself. So what, what Shaniqua Lewis is doing here helps her whole building and anyone that has to like walk through the sidewalks on this neighborhood street. And windows always remain shut. A cat will not sit in his litter box. So why do we have to sit in somebody else's litter? And this is not a recent problem either. Longtime residents say this has been going on for as long as they can remember, and nothing seems to be helping. You see, this, this is all stains from the water right here. So we will have to cross the street around, go around, and then walk into there. 14-year-old Jemiah says it also affects young people. We can't really do anything but stay in the house. And then when we do come outside, it's really, like, disgusting, and it just smells really bad. A housing authority spoke. It really does. I'm going to get into a second issue, but it, it does smell. Spokesperson <laughs> says in a statement in part, we are working with our qualified vendor to rectify this difficult and complex issue. If you've made it this far in this video, and we're looking at this statement from the housing authority, they say explicitly, our qualified vendor... On a scale of one to ten, how qualified vendor do you how qualified of a vendor do you think this is? Just on a blind guess, based on what we've looked at so far in this video. Issue: NYCHA has allocated a million dollars for required repairs. Sources say each building takes six to eight weeks to complete. They will put their tickets in. They'll handle it. They'll mop it. They'll sweep it. But the internal conflict is never solved. Residents say sludge seeps out weekly, rain or shine, despite ongoing efforts to stop the flow. So you've got sewage flooding out on the streets and they're like, oh, it's going to take us time to fix the underlying problem. And then the underlying problem's never fixed. And then you also have an issue in multiple areas across the five boroughs, obviously particularly concentrated in higher density populations with worse infrastructure. Problems like this. So, Ruben Diaz, this is from 2018, right? Yeah, December 30th, 2018. He tags the Housing Authority and the New York City Mayor. How about we try to start the new year off right for the tenants of the Sotomayor houses? These are disgusting, unacceptable conditions that foster rats and vermin infestations. This needs to be cleaned ASAP. And sometimes this is not, like, locked up like this. This is sitting on the curbs, on the sidewalk. Same sidewalk set. Sewage could be pumping out on. Just throw it all there. And it'll sit for days and days. No pickup. So it stinks so bad in the summer, and then in the winter, nearly 90% of Housing Authority apartments lost heat or hot water at least once during the winter. This is from 2019. Nearly 400,000 New Yorkers live in the Housing Authority's 174,000 apartments, and more than 150,000 of those units, 87%, lost heat or hot water at some point during the winter season. This data again demonstrates the Housing Authority's daily struggle to ensure that public housing residents have access to working heat and hot water. Yeah. As a landlord, the Housing Authority has a legal and moral obligation to ensure that these necessary utilities are functioning properly. So if the trash and the sewage and the lead are not big enough issues, we've also got a black mold problem. So for context here, back in December of 2013, an advocacy group, Group Metro Industrial Areas Foundation, sued the New York City Housing Authority for violating the Americans with Disabilities Act. The grounds there was that the New York City Housing Authority, as a landlord, was failing to abate mold from apartments of tenants who suffer with asthma. The Housing Authority settled the case a year later, and part of that settlement included a promise to clean up all simple cases of mold infection within seven days and more complex cases within 15 days. In 2018, they ended up back in court because mold was still an issue. I believe it was a first responder, a fire department worker, who responded to a call. A woman was having trouble breathing. She was elderly. And there was mold visible, black mold visible, in the eyesight of the de fire department worker. So they call it in and make the complaint, and then they're back in court. Now, this thing that's on my window right now is from June 29th, 2023. And on one hand, they want to throw a bone to the housing authority by saying the rate of monthly new tenant requests for mold and leak cleanups has dropped by 50%. But the problem is that there's a backlog sitting there. So, you know, obviously, if you already have a work order in for your unit, you're not going to file a new work order. You're going to call and ask for progress on that work order you already filed. So this backlog is, was rapidly growing, and they give us the numbers. So from 2019, October 2019, we went from a backlog of 35,718 unresolved mold repair requests to 90,589 unsolved, unresolved 
mold repair request in April 2023. It's a 150% increase. So great. The number of new requests is reducing, but the backlog's increasing by 150% over less than four years. So that's why you got to be careful with statistics, folks, because a statistic could sound good in a bubble, but then when you think about it, not so much. And then the housing authority around this time in 2023 ends up requesting $132 million in additional funding to address the backlog. Metro pulls this quote, This report shows that with strong independent oversight, the Housing Authority has been able to make real improvements in fixing mold and leaks. 150% increase in backlog over less than four years. But this is what the quote says. Leading to better conditions for thousands of Housing Authority families. Real improvements in fixing mold and leaks, but growing backlog. Rapidly growing backlog. Okay. Unfortunately, it's clear that most tenants are still suffering. The increased funding the Housing Authority calls for is critical. And the point I'm really getting at is not to come at the failures of what Metro is trying to accomplish or anyone with good intentions that is in communication with them and working to move this type of initiative forward. What I'm really getting at is when you put funding into something, and it could be going to contractors like this. So these people trying to deal with the backlog of work order issues. They need a contractor to come out and fix an exhaust system that's contributing to the growth of mold or do any type of contract work to ameliorate the root cause of the mold problem. You've got this funding coming in to pay for these contracts. Then the contracts are going where exactly? And while Metro can advocate and make reports, the oversight comes down to the housing authority as to who gets these contracts and who's able to go and fulfill the work if it's being done at all. And that's why ultimately this video is about the worst landlord, New York's worst landlord. Because again, almost 400,000 people live in some building that belongs to the housing authority. These 70 people charged with the corruption and the bribery, it sucks that they were doing that. But that's not going to solve the problem of how we got here. In 2019, Mayor de Blasio accepted a settlement, and part of that settlement was to bring on a federal monitor to deal with some of the underlying grievances against the New York City Housing Authority. This settlement set hard and fast deadlines for the Housing Authority to fix problems with lead paint, mold, rats, broken elevators, leaky pipes. But again, we just looked at something where from 2019 to 2023, backlogs just for mold problems. So it's here, there's been griping. There's been lawsuits. There's been new people taking new positions while other people resign. And we've got this as long as what's being alleged ends up being proven. That's a justifiable slap. You know, these 70 people shouldn't get away with taking the bribes just because the housing authority kind of made it possible and easy for them to do. But ultimately, this big picture problem is you have one of the biggest tenants in the world sitting on issues, and there's no centralized way for them to look at the work orders that are getting fired out of their office. And when the work isn't being done, services aren't being rendered, and yet the bill's somehow being paid, it makes you wonder if a simple budget increase is enough to fix a problem. And that's, of course, like anything in politics and money, budget debates are always hot debates. But I think it's fair enough to ask. So I'm asking you guys, is it as simple as saying, hey, if we increase this budget, we think this budget's enough. If we increase it and you give us this budget, we can properly restore 175,000 apartments and 325 of our housing projects over 10 years. Do you think it's that simple? Do you think we're free and clear because of this huge record-breaking bust? Do you think we're free and clear of the issue because of this record-breaking corruption bust? The floor is yours to let me know what you think. Everybody, I hope you take care.